going to be discussing how to make the most out of a small bankroll. So here's a question. I'm a new member with a small bankroll and struggle with knowing the best way to grow my bankroll. Can you give some advice? I mean, first things first, most people, as far as I can tell, don't like to talk very openly about their finances. Why? I don't know, but they don't do it. And um, I think you probably should, especially whenever you are talking to a coach, somebody you're asking for advice, right? Now, you certainly don't need to have your finances out for everyone to see. There's probably no purpose in that. But if you want to get good information from anyone, you need to give them as much information as you can about your actual problem. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to help you, right? Because, like, I don't know what this question actually is. Is this saying someone who's trying to become a full-time professional poker player? And so my advice for them is going to be very different than my advice for someone who is just playing for fun. And, you know, I de would ideally like to win, but doesn't really care at the end of the day. So anytime you are asking someone for help or for information, you need to give them as much information as you reasonably can so that they can give you as, as good of advice as they possibly can. All right. First things first, figure out what you want. Are you trying to go pro? Is the goal to quit your job and only play poker, right? I think a lot of people get in their minds, yeah, I want to be a professional poker player. But uh, no, you don't. If you have a family and kids and responsibilities, you probably don't want to be a professional poker player unless your other options are quite bad, right? The reason you see a lot of young-ish people getting into poker, or people my age who started when they were 18 getting into poker, is because whenever you're that age, you have no dependents, right? You have no kids, typically. Um, you have no real responsibilities. And you also don't really need to make money. And, and on top of that, you don't really have any other good opportunities. Now, some people do have good opportunities, but like... As a kid, I had just like marginal opportunities. I mean, I like I was going to college. I had a scholarship to where I like didn't need to make money. If I, I knew if I graduated college, I'd get a job making like 50K a year being an engineer. And there's nothing wrong with that. Fine. Perfectly fine. Good prospects. But it's not like I'm going to get super rich doing that. And also, I probably didn't know if I enjoyed it. That said, if you are already in a career and you make a decent amount of money and it's very stable and it pays your bills and then some you probably don't want to try to become a professional poker player. Next, are you just trying to make a little money? Look, I get emails all the time from people saying, hey, I, I want to get into poker and I want to learn to make, I don't know, $500 per month. How do I do it? First things first, you're never going to make consistently $500 per month. Some people get in their heads, all right, I'm going to play until I make $500 and I'm done for the month. But like, that's just ridiculous, right? Because some months, in theory, you could be making a ton, some are going to make less. And really, it's not that all that much in your control as long as you are studying a lot, putting in good volume and extracting value. And if your idea is I want to make X dollars per month, you kind of need to get that out of your head because that, that's just really not how poker works. And it's also very difficult to progress your bankroll and grow as a poker player if you are consistently taking some amount of money out of your bankroll. And I realize that some people want to make money from poker, but if you look at a lot of the best poker players in the world, or a lot of the poker players who have had decently long careers, not even playing the high stakes, but playing medium stakes, a lot of them don't really cash out all that much of their bankroll. They kind of just leave it there. And you know, they may invest it in stocks or cryptocurrency or gold or whatever, but they're not really spending the money, right? And I realize everybody has expenses, right? Everybody has these, you know, you got to pay for your housing. You got to pay for your car if you have a car. You got to pay for your insurance. You got you to pay for food, right? You got to buy all these things. But ideally, you want to keep all these expenses minimal. But that way, all of your money gets put into things that you could in turn resell if it comes to it, right? Um, one time I had a big downswing in my bankroll. And luckily, I had a bunch of gold sitting on the side. Sold some gold. Didn't want to. But, you know, that was a thing that I thought made the most sense to sell at that time. And I did it. It's kind of like moving down in stakes. The options are move down in stakes or sell some gold. And... Ideally, you want to make sure that whatever money you get, you're not really just spending on nonsense, but instead, like, effectively investing in things that you could resell if it comes to that. Uh, I say this a ton. You all know this. All you have to do to win is find a game you can beat, play it a ton, and keep a proper bankroll. That's all you really have to do. Next, are you playing to pass the time? These are effectively people who are playing for fun, right? Are you playing for fun? If you're playing for fun... In reality, 
I don't think you need to devote all that much time to studying and getting good. Now, obviously, you need to study some. You need to get a little bit of experience. You need to make sure you're not just torching your money, right? Because I can tell you, it's not fun to play poker if you're consistently losing. Even as a professional, sometimes you just have bad downswings. It's not fun when that happens. So in order to make sure that you are not in just a consistent, long-term, horrible downswing because you're bad, you need to study. You need to get at least some level of competence, which is why I have things like the tournament masterclass and the cash game masterclass, right? To get you up to speed. That said, if you are playing for fun slash to pass the time as a hobby, right? You should probably just play small games. Don't become a degenerate gambler to some extent because the problem is that with some people, perhaps like myself sometimes, once you get some level of, I don't know, you, once you get used to playing for some amount of money, you don't really want to play for less money. And that will inevitably result in you having to play at the same level or higher. And whenever your current level is not available for whatever, you may play higher. If you keep playing higher and higher and higher, next thing you know, you're playing high stakes in games that you are going to be a big loser in, and you're just torching your money, right? And especially if you are working on a limited budget, like you're not just super rich, you can't really go around playing high stakes poker games. Because imagine if you play even, I don't know, five, 10, no limit or thousand dollar buy-in tournaments and you are a small loser, you may be losing, I don't know, 25, 50, a hundred dollars per hour. If you're losing a hundred dollars per hour, every time you go to the casino, if you play an eight hour session, you're losing $800 per day. You gotta have a good job to lose $800 per day. And there aren't many hobbies that cost you $800 per day. Maybe going out fishing on a boat with seven motors or something will cost you $800 a day in gas. But not a whole lot costs you $800 per day. It's hard, hard to spend $800 a day. And uh, with poker, you have like literally nothing to show for it. At least with um, when you go fishing, you maybe catch some fish or something. When you go golfing, you at least get to go out there and play golf and have an experience. When you play poker, you just sit there and lose $800 per day on average. It's not fun. Not good. So ideally, you want to keep the games you're playing small, especially if you are aware enough to realize you are not going to devote a lot of your time to getting good at poker, right? All you have to do to win is find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. This implies you have an adequate level of skill. You got to study some. Going through the master classes or the 30-day challenges on poker coaching are a great way to get up to an adequate level of skill somewhat quickly for most games, especially the like non-highest stakes games. Next, play your game a lot. Don't be afraid to get in there and play. Like I said, the goal is not to like win some amount of money then quit. The goal is to extract value and realize you're going to make X dollars per hour. There's going to be a lot of variance. And understand that. Sometimes you're going to have good runs. Sometimes you're going to have bad runs. And that's completely out of your control. Um, next, keep a proper bankroll. Okay? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So which game is ideal for you? First things first, start off playing tiny stakes. Now, I realize some sites online have tiny stakes games that are effectively not beatable because the rake is too high. Um, same thing in live poker, right? If you're playing tiny stakes, no limit hold'em, they may rake you to death there. So make sure the rake is beatable. If you have any rake questions, feel free to ask them. I'm sure we've discussed rake at some point. Um, so, but, but you want to start off playing small so that you can figure out if you actually have an edge, right? You need to find a game you can beat. Find a game you can beat. Now, obviously, if you are in good financial shape, tiny stakes for you may not be the same as tiny stakes for someone with no money. Back when I first started, I had $50, right? You can't play all that big with $50. So I played the smallest stakes game that, that were available at the time on the internet. Whenever I was 18 years old, I played the tiniest games that were available because I did not know if I was good at poker because I had literally no experience. And I wanted to prove to myself that I was actually a winner before actually playing for bigger money. And also the nice thing about that is that you grow your bankroll along the way. And uh, the nice thing about poker is that to some extent, your bankroll that you have won from poker, not what you buy in for, but what you have won from poker is kind of indicative of your skill level, especially in cash games. Not so much in tournaments because you can just get lucky and win a big tournament and or win a big field tournament and have a lot of buy-ins. But in general, in cash games at least, your skill level is somewhat equal to your bankroll or what your bankroll allows. Um, same thing for things like sit and goes where there's not nearly as much variance. Basically, as there's less variance in the game, your results are more and more indicative of your actual skill level. All right, so which game is ideal for you? Cash games are great because you can play as much or as little as you want whenever you want, which is what works for most people's lives, right? Most people don't have a ton of time to devote to their hobby or their new potential career, right? Because you have other stuff going on. 
Um, I mean, like whenever I was playing poker, I was going to college, I was working a job, actually working two jobs, and I got to fit poker in for like four hours per day, right? Two hours per day, whatever. Not a lot, because I had a lot of other stuff going on. So, and, and because of that, I, I could not play multi-table tournaments. And really, I didn't play multi-table tournaments at all until I was, I don't know, like eight, 19 or 20 years old. so like a year or two of playing online with no multi-table tournaments at all because I could not devote eight hours to sitting there and playing, right? Because I had other stuff going on. Um, that said, the problem, especially today with cash games, is that they're usually much tougher than tournaments at comparable buy-in levels. However, live, cash games are still great. In most casinos, in most places, you can find a you know 2-5 no limit game that is reasonably soft, that if you're good, you can beat for $50 per hour or so, and there won't be a ton of variance. So live cash games, I think, are great. Online cash games, maybe not so much, because everybody online is pretty good at this point. Um, cash games are usually pretty low variance compared to tournaments. Like I said, your, your results are going to be somewhat indicative of your skill level, especially over a decently big sample. What's a decently big sample? You know, if you play, I don't know, eight hours per day, five days per week, so like a full-time job at a casino, and you do that for, I don't know, three months, you'll probably have pretty indicative results. I mean, back when I used to play at Bellagio every day, I'd play 5, 10, or 10, 20 at Bellagio every day, and I don't think I had a losing month. To be fair, I was playing like 70 hours a week, so it's almost like I'm playing two months every month compared to what most people do. But like, I mean, I was sitting there with a $100 per hour win rate, pay me $100 per hour, I'll sit there and grind all day, right? Especially if it's like kind of low risk, and it really was pretty low risk. So cash games are nice for that. Tournaments require you to play long sessions, but they are usually quite soft, even at the high stakes. I mean, in the, uh, the $10,000 and $25,000 and $50,000 tournaments I played recently at US Poker Open, they were very soft. I mean... At every table, there were probably, it was eight-handed tables, there were probably five good players, three clearly recreational players. Tournaments are pretty soft. There's usually some pretty bad players in tournaments, and that's because a lot of the players in tournaments like the idea of, I'm going to go and I'm going to lose one or two buy-ins. I know what I'm going to lose if I lose, and I know I'm going to play for a few hours on average. If I win, I'm going to spin it up a lot. It's like a parlay, right? And that leads to the recreational players who gamble at tournaments usually being pretty gambling. Uh, tournaments are very are, are high variance. It's important to realize tournaments are high variance, right? Um, a lot of people don't fully understand the variance. There's a website called pokerdope.com. I think they actually changed the name. I forget what it is now. But pokerdope.com, if you go there, it'll redirect to this site, and there's a tournament variance calculator there. Go there, play around with it, check it out. You're going to see that there is a lot of variance. And um, you have to understand that. So if you're playing on a small bankroll... If you don't have all that much money, you either need to be playing really tiny stakes tournaments, in which case your win rates is not going to be that high. Like if you're playing a $1 tournament, you have a 50% return on investment, you make 50 cents per game. It's not all that much money. Let's say you play four per day, you make $2 per day on average, still with a lot of variance, right? And that, that's, that's not a lot of money, right? That said, if you make $2 per day, you have $100 to start, let's say, you double your bankroll in 50 days. Think about that. If you can double your bankroll every two months, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And and you really can like literally double it at the small stakes. You can go from 100 to 200 to 400 to 800 to 1,600 within, what, a year? That's five doubles. Yeah, you can reasonably do that. So in a year, you can 5x your money for small amounts of money. Now, as you start playing bigger and bigger stakes, your edge is going to go down, and um, that's going to result in you not doubling every X number every two months or so. It becomes more like every four months or every eight months. But, you know, that's fine because you're playing for bigger money, right? All right, bankroll requirements. If you are not a professional, even if you are a professional, do you have a disposable income stream, like money that is coming in consistently that you know you can reasonably lose and you'll, your life will be okay? Some people have this, some people don't. For the longest time in my poker career, I had no other money and no other opportunities. Now I have a training site, pokercoaching.com, and I have books, and all this stuff brings in a little bit of money here and there, and that makes it to where I could potentially play a little bit bigger. For example, $50,000 buying tournaments are a little bit out of my budget. But, you know, if I lose, it's okay. Make content for a month. You'll be good to go, right? I, but, like, if you have a job and you're making, let's say you make, I don't know, $100,000 per year, fifty. let's say $50,000 per year, right? You have a reasonable job, making fifty dollars per year. 
if your expenses each year are like 20k or 30k because you're doing what i said and not spending a ton of money let's say you spend 20k per month i'm sorry 20k per year on expenses that means you have thirty thousand dollars of disposable income now obviously you should be investing some of this money right for retirement or you know in general but if you have let's say twenty thousand dollars per month or twenty thousand per year of disposable income let, you could reasonably lose, let's say, $12,000 of it, and you'll be fine, right? That is 1000 bucks per month. They kind of have a disposable income, and it's almost as if, if you know you're going to play poker for, let's say, $50 buy-ins, that gives you, effectively, 20 buy-ins per month, every month. You basically have, like, an unlimited bankroll to some extent at that point, right? Because you're not going to play all that much. You're going to clearly win some, sometimes, and if you have a thousand dollars per month to play with, you don't you, like you can start playing fifty dollar tournaments immediately with a thousand dollars in your bankroll, twenty buy-ins, because you know you've already partitioned this money every month for the next twelve months, let's say, to figure out if you're any good at this game, right? So if you have disposable income, then you don't really need to keep all that much money on hand because you're going to con consistently make that money. Now, obviously, all jobs are not consistent. I would recommend not losing 25% of your money each year or whatever it is playing uh, any game, any any poker game. But you don't have to be sitting there with like 200 buy-ins or 300 buy-ins because you basically have that money coming to you in the future. Now, obviously, if that income stream changes, usually this only matters when it decreases or goes away, you got to knit up and don't look for poker as a way to gamble and try to get rich quick unless you very clearly have proven that you have an edge. And even then, it's it's very tough. Poker is a great hobby, hard profession. All right. Uh, if you do not have an income stream, like most professional poker players don't have any other money coming in, you need to keep a lot of cash on hand. Now, not necessarily cash like liquid cash. It can be in stocks or other semi-liquid assets. You don't want to put it in things like um, a house because if you put all your money in a house and you need some money, you may have a problem. This happened to me in the past. Uh, remember when I said I had to sell gold while I was sitting there with, I don't know, $500,000 in property that I could not reasonably liquidate. I would have loved to take $500,000 out of houses and just sell $20,000 of it, right? Um, instead, I had to sell little chunks of my gold, and I had less than 500k in gold. I don't know, let's say I had 50k in gold. I had to sell 20k of it. I had to sell 40% of my gold. I would have much rather sold, you know, 5% of my house or houses. So you don't really want to be taking your money and locking it up too much. Locking up something is good. But at the same time, if you are clearly a professional, you don't want to super lock it up because then you can't access it. And sometimes you will need to access it, especially if you are playing in games that reasonably push the boundaries of your bankroll. Um, okay, so assuming you have a decent edge, keep roughly 30 buy-ins for soft cash games, usually live cash games. I think 30 buy-ins is fine. If you start dipping down below to like 20, you should probably move down for sure. Um, if you get down to like 29, I'm not going to say you should move down, but if you get down to 20, you probably should move down. The nice thing about moving down when things go poorly is that you basically double your bankroll in terms of buy-ins, right? Um, in cash games, a buy-in is, in my mind, about 100 big blinds, okay? So that's that's relevant. Uh, for tough cash games, these are going to be like online cash games, you need something like 100 buy-ins. Okay, so 100, 100 big blind buy-ins. For tournaments, for small field tournaments where you have a reasonable edge, let's say 30%, 50%, something like that, you're going to need roughly 100 buy-ins. It's a lot. Remember, there's a lot of variance in tournaments. And for large field tournaments, you need substantially more buy-ins because the variance is going to be bigger. You're going to have substantially bigger swings in tournaments where almost none of the field gets in the money just because you don't win all that often, right? So because you know, if, you're, if you're playing a 1,000-person tournament, you're going to make the final table one in 100 times. Imagine you play 100 tournaments per year, and they're 1,000-person tournaments. It's a reality check for some of you out there. You're going to have one final table per year. That's if you play two tournaments per week. Wait, wait, wait. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Yeah, two tournaments per week with 1,000 people each. You're going to make one final table per year on average. If you're good, maybe you make two. If you're unlucky, zero. Okay? You got to realize that. You have to know what you sign up for. And, um, you know... That's why you need a big bankroll because you can easily go a year or two or three with no no deep runs, and that's going to result in this bankroll just getting dwindled down substantially. It's important. You've got to keep a proper bankroll. If you don't, you're going to lose. Next, don't be too quick to move up. A lot of poker players want to get rich quick. They want to push the boundaries hard. 
And while there's nothing wrong with pushing the boundaries hard, that will result in you potentially developing, let's call it degenerate tendencies, where you just always want to play bigger and bigger. And also that will result in you potentially playing in games where you don't have an edge with a lot of your bankroll at risk. Um, what some people do, for example, go back over here to live cash games. Dale DeGrande talked about how he did this as a kid. When I interviewed him on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash poker coaching, he said he would not recommend this for anyone today. But he'd be like, yeah, if I have 10 buy-ins, I'll play whatever game I can with 10 buy-ins. If I get up to, let's say, 15 or 20, I'm moving up. If I get down to five, I'm moving down so I have 10 again. Very aggressive bankroll management. And you know what happened? He went broke most of the time. He went broke over and over and over and over and over again. I personally don't want to be broke and not have to worry. I don't like having to worry about where I'm going to live, what I'm going to eat, etc. I like to have these things reasonably taken care of. And if you don't push the boundaries hard, yeah, you're not going to get rich quick, but you're also not going to get broke either. And that's very relevant. There's a lot of value in staying in action. Now, back in the day, I think loans and staking was substantially more common because everybody was being a degenerate back in the day. Nobody knew to keep a big bankroll. But in today's world, if you do go broke, kind of hard to get back in action, I think. Unless you have like really good connections or you have very clearly proven yourself to be a very, very good winner. So look, don't be in a rush. I took it really slow, probably a little bit too slow. Um, but I was, I've literally never been at risk of going broke, right? Sometimes you have to dip into your, I guess, reserve fund, call it whatever you want, where it's like locked up money. But literally never gone broke, been nowhere near going broke. And that will result in me not moving up quite as quick as some people, but also it results in me literally never going broke. And I think there's a lot of value to that, especially if you know you're going to be in this for a long time and, uh, you know, you kind of want to <laughs> sleep easy at night. Just because other people gamble and sometimes win huge does not mean that that is the ideal strategy for long-term success. So many people watch these poker players playing loose, aggressive, splashy, battling poker, and sometimes they win. And they get shown off. They get bragged about. They get coverage. But a lot of other people do the exact same thing and they lose and they get no coverage. The media likes to show off the winners in the poker space and it doesn't really highlight the losers. And it turns out a lot of the losers are people who are really pushing the boundaries. Um, a lot of people, well, a lot of people, every once in a while, someone will, will run hot in, let's say, the $100 buy-in tournaments and they go from having, let's say, $10,000 to $100,000, like overnight, right? Then, you know what they do? Instead of being adequately skilled for the next buy-in level, they, they just decide to move up to the $1,000 games because, hey, they got 100 buy-ins, why not? And sometimes they run hot there too. It is possible for someone to run hot every year. Look at who the player of the year is. That person ran hot. I was player of the year one year, and I ran ungodly hot. I probably won, I don't know, two-thirds of my coin flips. And uh, you win two-thirds of your flips in high-stakes tournaments, you're going to win a bunch of money. I've also had other years that have been horrible. Did I all of a sudden get really bad at poker? No, just didn't win my flips. Remember when Justin Bonomo was on his insane run where he won like the one drop and a bunch of other stuff and they interviewed him. They said like, what's changed over the last two years to let you crush the tournament so hard? He's like, nothing's changed. It's just been running hot. And it's true. He realizes this, right? He's a, he came from the sit and go space like me and he realizes that there's a ton of variance in poker. But he put in a lot of volume in games he can beat. Sometimes it works out, right? Once it's clear that you are winning, which requires a bit of time, a bit of a sample size, right? Once it's clear you're winning, then move up. Don't be scared of moving up. Some other people have the problem that's the opposite of degeneracy where they just want to lock up the free win. And that's fine and good, but you're never going to become a really great poker player by staying well within your comfort zone. You do have to push the boundaries a little bit. I'm not saying do it in Daniel Negreanu style where you're constantly trying to move up. But at the same time, there you should be trying to move up because whenever you move up, you basically double your income or 1.5x your income, whatever it is. And that's quite powerful. It turns out if you can double your income over and over, you're going to start making a bunch of money, right? And to be fair, like even today where I realize poker is much tougher than it was back in the day, you can still make $100 per hour from poker pretty reasonably if you get very good, you game select well, you play in good times, and you know you put in a lot of volume. And 100 bucks an hour is a lot of money. If you grind hard, if your only goal is to win money, you play 70 hours a month, or sorry, 70 hours a week, six, let's, say, let's play you say 60 hours a week. 
what is that? 240 hours per month. That's $24,000 per month. It's a lot of money. I mean, what is that? $300,000 per year, roughly? Call it 250 if you want to take some time off or play less. 250K a year, being, you know, very good at something like 5 to no limit, it's a lot of, a lot of money. A lot, a lot of money. Like, I don't know why you would want to just be comfortable, comfortable, playing 1 2, making, let's say, 50K a year when it's not even much of a gamble at all to try to move up to potentially make 300k per year, 250k per year. Because whenever you try to move up, if it goes poorly, just move back down. Yeah, you lose a little bit of money, but you get some experience at the higher stakes games, and you move back down to your 1-2 game. Continue making your 50k a year. Like, that should be the fail case, not the goal, right? Now, once you get to 510, as you start going higher and higher, the games do get substantially tougher, and that's when like game selection and networking becomes highly valuable. Or if you're playing tournaments, that's where you like really have to be playing, like traveling a lot, which I realize a lot of people don't want to do. Um, but like for most people living in a place where they have 510 no limit, you can make that 250K a year. For 25 no limit, you can make 125K per year. It's good money. All right. Um, make sure you are properly or close to properly bankrolled for larger games whenever you go to move up. Let's say you know you want to keep 30 buy-ins. If there is a game where you have 50 buy-ins, let's say, I'm sorry, if there's a game where you have like 25 buy-ins, so that means you have 50 buy-ins at your current level, 25 at the next high level, the, the doubled up level, um, it's probably fine to take a shot there. You lose two or three buy-ins, move back down. You have to be disciplined for taking shots though. Um, you should definitely be taking shots in overly soft games that are about two times your normal game. So if you normally play 2-5 and there's a 5-10 game that's clearly soft because everybody's having a party and clearly super loose gambling players there and there's not very many good players there you should probably take a shot i mean imagine let's say you do have fifteen thousand dollars playing two five 30 buy-ins and you're a good player i would immediately ask why do you only have 15k if you're a good player either that means you have not put in much time or maybe you're not as good as you think you are make sure you keep good records obviously i didn't say that but that's obvious to me keep diligent records of how you're winning and losing but say there is, say you do have 15k, 50 buy, 15 buy-ins for 510, and there's a game going off insanely. In that scenario, you should probably take a shot and go give yourself a two buy-in shot there at that soft game. If you lose 2,000 bucks, go back to your regular game. Yeah, you have to grind out 40 hours to win it back, but such is life. It is a good gambling spot, and that's like kind of an extreme gambling shot, right? Usually, if you're playing two five and you're just like a good solid winner, then you can, like, you'll have more than 15K. You'll have 75K or something just sitting there waiting for this good game to run, in which case you lose 5,000 bucks there. It's not a big deal, right? A great example of this was me playing at Bellagio. Like I said, I would play 5, 10, or 10, 20 every day. I did this for like a year and change. And I had a big bankroll. I had, I don't know, a million bucks playing this 5, 10 game that I needed, uh, what, $30,000? Is that right? Yeah, I needed $30,000, but I'm sitting there with a million dollars, okay? Well bankrolled. 10, 20, we need, uh, let's say, 100,000 for 10, 20. We have a million, right? I would sit there and play those games, and then every once in a while, a bigger game would run that was abnormally soft. There was often a 25-50 game there running, by the way. I did not play it very often at all, despite being properly bankrolled for it. Why? Because it was often tough. It was like the best players plus one bad player playing 25-50, whereas the 5-10 game was all bad players <laughs> and like two good players. So I could play in this super-duper soft 5-10 game or a really tough 25-50 game, you don't need to do it, right? Just because you are properly bankrolled for a game does not mean it is the proper play. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, anyway, anyway, every once in a while, bigger stakes games would run, and if they're soft, I would play. Do we consider a buy-in 100 big blinds? Yeah, that's what we're considering it, but I mean, again, it, it's roughly 100 big blinds um, for cash games. So every once in a while, a bigger game would run, 25-50. I remember one time I played uh, 200-400, no limit. It was me, Andrew Robel, this other guy named Pat, and these two very clearly recreational players who came in and wanted to gamble. I saw uh, Andrew Robel and Pat playing, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm in the game because these two guys clearly don't know what they're doing. Andrew and Pat think it's a good game. And uh, so I sat down. We played five-handed for like two hours. I stacked one of them, won, I think I actually won 80K in like two hours, and the game ended. And that was it, right? And that kind of opportunity comes up every once in a while where I, I don't know how much of a bankroll you need for 200, 400, but a million bucks is probably not it. You probably need more, right? But the game was soft, thought it was a good spot. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It turns out in cash games, I've been very lucky taking these shots 
where I'm essentially just table selecting, game selecting really, really hard and playing in the games when they're abnormally soft. So say you nor do, normally do play 2-5 No Limit at your casino or even 1-3 at your casino. And for some reason, somebody wants to stumble in late at night to play 5-10 No Limit and it's you and them and maybe another bad player and another good player, that's a good spot to take a shot if you, are, if you know you're like a definitive winner in the 1-3 game. Because if you win, you increase your bankroll substantially. If you lose, yeah, you lose some money, but you know you can go back down and grind it back up. Often as well, whenever you take a shot, your downside is very capped, right? Like if I lost, I think I was probably going to lose like 100K in the 200, 400 game, so 250 big blinds. If I lost that, yeah, it sucks, but that's like the most I can lose, right? There's a chance though, I could win a ton. Now, it turns out both these guys showed up, they lost whatever, 60, 80K each, and then they left. But there's a chance they just go off, right? And if they're going to go off and just play all night and lose 500K each, <laughs> that's a pretty good spot for you to be in, right? So usually if you're smart with shot taking, your well, if you are shot taking intelligently, your downside risk is very capped, whereas the upside risk is relatively uncapped. Also, that'll give you a bigger bankroll, potentially allow you to play bigger games. Um, next, typically you do not want to take gigantic shots. Now, I know I just talked about this going from 1020 to 200, 400. That's an anomaly. But say you are a tournament player. You don't want to take shots where you normally play, let's say, $100 buy-in tournaments, and then you move to a $3,500 buy-in tournament that's the main event at your casino or whatever. A lot of poker players really mess this up. What they do every year is they grind it out in their local games playing $100 buy-in tournaments or whatnot. They win $15,000, $20,000, $30,000 every year like clockwork, playing in soft games, soft small field games. Then they take that twenty dollars or thirty dollars to the World Series of Poker and play like five dollars $1,500 buy-in tournaments. And then they're usually going to lose, right? And so they go there and they lose 7,500 bucks out of their 10, 20, 30K they win. And it's just like completely unnecessary. They're trying to, they're basically grinding it out all year to take a shot in super high variance games. And it just doesn't really make a lot of logical sense. Wouldn't you rather just play your $100 buy-in games for five years, make 150K, 120K, whatever. Remember, as your bankroll gets bigger, you can play $200 games and $300 games in your local casino. So you're... You're going to be able to grind it up exponentially to some extent. And then after five years, you have 150 k and you're like starting to get reasonably bankrolled for these $500,000 buy-in big field tournaments, right? That way you're not taking a shot where you go back home losing half your money or all of your money. Um, someone I know on a regular basis, he would win $10,000 per year, go to the World Series, lose all of it. Sometimes he'd run hot. Every time he ran hot, he'd buy a car or something. So like, you know, torched his run hot money, didn't save it. And that's going to result in you just like never having money despite being pretty good at poker. Because if you can win $10,000 playing $100 tournaments every year, it's like pretty good, right? But you just always end up broke because you spend the money you win whenever you do run hot in the big games and usually you lose in the big games, right? Be quick to move back down. I know I put this here at the bottom of the slide, but uh, this is very important. Be quick to move back down. Go back to the previous slide. Don't be in a rush. Poker is a great way to get rich slowly. Do not have ego problems. This is important, very important. Many decent players go broke because they refuse to accept reality, whatever reality actually is. Look at your situation, observe it intelligently, and realize the spot that you are in. Maybe you're in a great spot, maybe you're in a bad spot. Ask yourself, for example, tournament players out there who win a thousand buy-ins or a hundred buy-ins in a tournament, ask yourself, am I actually adequately skilled to play games five times the size just because my bankroll indicates it? With me, when I used to play Five ten no limit that need I needed a thirty thousand dollar bankroll for. When I'm saying there were a million dollars, was I adequately skilled to beat the twenty five fifty game? Maybe, but like why? There's no point because I know your win rate in that game is just never going to be that big, right? But my butt was in a chair waiting for the super soft big games to run, right? That you know maybe I'm not even properly bankrolled for, but we'll take a shot. So you. A lot of people think they are better than they are. They don't keep good results. They or don't keep good records of their results. They um, they just don't observe reality properly. And this it's a hard thing to do. If you have poker playing friends who you can ask their opinion and you respect their opinion, ask their opinion. Get other, get input from other people who you respect. Now make sure you respect good people. Um, ask like poker coaching coaches. If you ask any poker coaching coach here questions about your skill level compared to the opponents or whatnot, they're going to be able to give you a reasonably good answer, like probably a very good answer, right? And I've told many students, look, you're not skilled enough to beat these games. Some care, some don't. Those who don't usually don't win. 
I mean, I can give my opinion, but if you know, you're welcome to not take it. So ideally, you whenever you're like, you want to make sure you understand what's actually happening. And if you understand what's actually happening, then there will be no surprises whenever things inevitably go poorly or they go well or whatever, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, more than you would think, or maybe not more than you think, I don't know. A lot of people think that once they move up, that they are a failure at life if they have to move back down because things go poorly. What happens to some people is they play 2-5 no limit, grind it up, get a 50k bankroll, move up to 5-10, they're being responsible. They move to 5-10 with 50 buy-ins, they play, they lose, they lose, they lose, they lose down to 30k, they lose down to 20k. And then they're like, huh, I have 20k, I'm not properly bankrolled for this game anymore, what do I do? Well, the answer is not keep playing it. The answer is move down and grind up your bankroll to give yourself essentially another good opportunity at the 510 game if you even feel inclined to try to move to it maybe you are in the same spot i was in where your 510 game was super soft or sorry super tough but the 25 game is super soft if that's the case then you maybe don't need to play that 510 game the way it essentially works is imagine you're playing a higher stakes game but your win rate is halved you'd rather play the smaller game because there's way less variance right and that's kind of what i was dealing with at bellagio i knew i could win about 100 bucks an hour at 510 i also knew i could win about 110 dollars per hour at 1020 little bit more but a lot more variance at least over the sample that i had and i had a, I had a pretty good sample at 2550 i didn't know what i could reasonably win because i did not put in a lot of time there but i can look around the table and see everybody is good besides one player who's not even that bad right so i know that there is not going to be much of an edge there so i know that game is not going to be all that profitable because the losing player there is losing let's say 500 dollars per hour divided by nine or eight other good players 500 divided by 8 is what? 40 bucks per hour? It's not a good win rate. It's not like I'm going to be that much better than any of the other good players there. So whatever, like you make 100 bucks per hour at most. So I'd rather make 100 bucks per hour playing 510 with no risk, $110 per hour playing 1020 with like some risk and certainly more swings, or 2550 where uh, who knows what I'd win, but it would certainly be about 100 bucks per hour, right? It makes a lot of sense to just play the 510 game because it's free right and in your local casino is maybe like one uh two five is free and five ten is tough i don't know you got to get in there figure it out this is where students come to me and give me very very clear pictures of what's happening and i can give the best advice i possibly can anyway though say you do play the five ten game and you think you're supposed to be winning here but you just keep losing and you don't really know why hire a coach immediately to figure out why but also move back down also once you do start beating the game it's happened to me to some extent a long time ago i kind of stopped studying right why because i'd rather just sit there and grind out my money but you need to continuously study you really do a lot of um very good poker players i mean kind of kind of roughly my age had good success when they were young they were studying a lot devoting all their time to poker then as they get older they start making even more money because you know they have a bigger bankroll to continue playing bigger but they just want to grind it out and make the money. And then they stop studying, and then next thing you know, they lose their edge, right? Some other poker players assume that if they're good at poker, that they must be good at all other aspects of life. A great example of this recently has been cryptocurrencies, right? So many poker players, so many poker players, think that because they're good at poker, they must be good at other things that most people have no clue about, right? Cryptocurrencies are relatively new, so almost no one's an expert. And if you're spending all your time at the poker table, you're definitely not an expert, right? Because you're not devoting any time to it or you're devoting minimal amounts of time to it. This is a very good example of like people who just think that if they are studying some or more than their peers, that they must be good. But especially in things like the investing world, you are literally playing at some of the most sophisticated people in the world who have technologies you are completely unaware of and they're going to crush you. So don't be egotistical and think that just because you are good at poker that you must be good at other things. Realize the amount of skill it takes to get good at poker and the amount of dedication it gets good to poker and realize the amount of effort you've put into that, it's probably a lot, right? Every other thing in the world takes about that much effort to become very, very good at and to be able to make a substantial amount of income from it. And if you like realize <laughs> you're not doing that, then I uh, hate to break it to you. You're going to be a loser or just like kind of breaking even. Now, the nice thing about some things like investing is that some things inevitably just kind of go up, like stock market just kind of goes up over time because... You're investing in companies that produce value, right? Obviously, there are going to be big swings in that too. But if you invest in companies, especially big companies that have been around for a while, they produce value. And you're not going to get rich investing in these things, but you're going to grow a little bit. And 
I mean, I don't know. We're not getting to investment advice here, but you get what I'm saying, right? Don't presume that just because you're good at poker that you're good at other stuff. Again, all you have to do to win is find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. This here gives you a positive win rate. This here decreases variance, and this here ensures you are never going to go broke. It doesn't actually decrease variance, but you get through the variance, right? Variance will still be there. You're still going to have big wins. You're still going to have big losses in terms of upswings and downswings, but, you know, you'll get through them. Okay? So that's it. That's my talk on how to make the most of a small bankroll. If you have literally, oh, well, I guess I should say this. If you have, like, literally no or almost no money, like me, when I started, I had $50. Online poker is amazing because you can play literally one cent, two cent, right? Make sure you can beat the rake. But play small. Play tiny. There's nothing wrong with playing tiny, especially if you do not already know if you're a good, strong, winning player. And if you have a small or non-existent bankroll, it kind of implies you're not all that good at poker or you just haven't played all that much. If you're new to anything, don't try to just jump in the high stakes and get rich quick because you're not skilled, right? And poker is a game that can be immensely rewarding, but it can also be incredibly detrimental if you are just taking all your money every week and gambling with it, right? So the fact that you have a tiny bankroll is kind of irrelevant because you can always split even a $50 bankroll into 100 50-cent chunks, right? Or $50 chunks and grind it up. I already showed you, you can double your bankroll roughly every two month if, months if you just put in decent volume. Not even decent volume, like a little bit of volume. And, uh, you know, don't be in a rush. So many people are in a rush to get rich quick. If you don't have $50, you should probably get a job. Hate to break it to you, but you got to have a little bit of money to make decent money at poker. And um, even if you get, like, a minimum wage job, you know, like, that, that will hopefully pay your bills and give you a little bit of disposable income, maybe not a minimum wage job, depends on where you live. But um, you know what I'm saying, right? Like if you're making, if you have like literally no money, you probably need to get a job and to, to just to, to survive, right? The great thing about most jobs, by the way, is that they only take 40 hours per week. That gives you a lot of other time to do other stuff, like get another job if necessary. I used to have two jobs when I went to college and that's because I wanted to have some money and I liked both my jobs, right? And... I didn't mind it. Didn't want to do it for forever, but I also didn't mind it. And I realized I need to pay my bills. So you need you need a healthy dose of reality is what it amounts to and understand the situation you're in and then figure out where to go from there.